Today we uh, want to continue our lessons on discipleship, and today's lesson is about learning to pray. And I'm so grateful that you came here for our third class of our 12th on learning to pray, Discipleship 201. I'm, I appreciate this lesson because it's personal to me. Prayer is a difficult, challenging thing for me for a reason. My mind is always distracted by a hundred different things. It goes a million miles an hour. It's always thinking about the next thing. It's always thinking about the thing I just did, and what I did wrong, and what I'm going to do tomorrow. Okay? Those are things my mind is going on. And so my mind is always active. And so I have a very odd and peculiar prayer life, I think, probably compared to most people. But so I'm not here to today to tell you how to pray. I'm here to show you that prayer takes on many forms, and you need to find a way that works best for you. Because God created me the way I am, and I'm not beating myself up over the fact that I pray a very unique and challenging way for what many of you would consider prayer. And so as we look at prayer for today, we, we need to understand what prayer is. Prayer is a talk with God. It's a walk with God. It's a privilege to be able to talk to the Almighty and understand that God is listening to you. And it's more than just a few ritualized uh, prayers. Now, I'm not going to be here standing critical of those who participate in ritual prayers. God is great. God is good. Now, let, let me thank Him for our food or whatever. If that's what you pray every day before your meal, good for you. Over the lips, over the gums, look out, tell me, here it comes. Good for you. If you participate in those rituals, I've got no problems with that, okay? But your prayer life needs to be deeper than that as well, too. It needs to be different than that. Imagine for a minute, when we think of prayer, we often are stuck on these formula prayers or prayers in a time of crisis. You know, oh, God, I just crashed my car. Help my parents not find out. I don't Something like that. What are the prayers that we pray? You're laughing. Did you do that? No, never. Oh, my goodness. We get into these crises, and we just want God to make it all go away. Imagine for a minute that you treated your best friend that way. So you only picked up the phone, and you said, hey, what's up, homeboy, or whatever. I don't know. I do that really badly. And they say, hey, what's up? And that's the end of your conversation. Oh, and then you call them up whenever, hey, guess what? I need a 1000 bucks. Why don't you loan it to me? What type of friend would you be? What type of friendship would you have? But that's often how we treat our relationship with God. God knows what we need. It's not about asking for things. Prayer is so much better than that. So what is prayer? Prayer is, letter A, our lifeline to the, to the Christian and our Christian church. Through prayer, we grow in our relationship with God. And so prayer, in addition to the ritualized prayers, which again are fine, I would never be critical of those who participate regularly in ritualized prayers, but it also needs to be personal and public in nature. You need to live your life of prayer every single day. Now, I again want to go back to this ritualized prayer. I know that sometimes for me, the, the ritualized prayers of our church are so powerful. And I'm going to tell you why they can be powerful. Because they connect me to people who said the exact same prayer a thousand years ago. Think about that for a minute. You're praying a same prayer that maybe St. Anselm prayed or St. Augustine prayed, or St. Francis prayed. That makes me weep with great joy to think that I am connected with the great tapestry of humanity through a prayer that they prayed thousands of years ago. How cool is that? So don't give up ritualized prayers. I'm certainly not critical of that. But understand that God has a differing expectation of prayer life to go in a different direction too. Look at letter B. Through prayer, we develop again that relationship with God. And we know how we develop that relationship with God because we looked at that a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the name of God. What do we call God? We call God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I know we're a little slow on the uptake today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is really cool because when he talks about God as Father, he actually uses a very specific Aramaic word that is better translated as daddy. How awesome is that? You have the privilege to go to the almighty God who transcends all that exists and call that God daddy. My heavenly daddy. I think that's amazing. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if you go up to your, your father on earth and you're going to say, 
Father, I would like to borrow the car for a date tonight. Well, that's, you know, you want to wrap your daddy around, your father around the finger, you go up and say, Daddy, I want to go on a date tonight. Will you load the car, Daddy? All of a sudden, now you got that daddy of yours wrapped around the finger. Why? Because that word daddy is so much more intimate and powerful. I'm just telling you, Chris. You want, you, want, you want to get something from me? You just come and say, Oh, Daddy. And I'll just say, <laughs> now she knows the secret. She's going to take notes now. Whoa! All right, let's go on. Now we call God Daddy, not because God is a male. Remember we talked about the fact that God is not a man, an old guy in the sky with a long white beard. That's not God. God is not male or female, but God has put the image of God of both male and female. But what it does do is that we are, we are limited by our language, and so we, we need to find a way to express that intimate relationship uh, built upon, uh, you know, that we have with God. And so that's why we communicate it through the word dad. So don't get stuck up on the fact that it's a male word. But the second thing, we also can call God the son, Jesus. But you know what? That makes you Jesus our brother, okay? So think about this way. You can treat God like a brother. You can tell your brother anything if it's a close brother. You tell your brother about all those close scrapes you had and all those things you just don't want mom and dad to find out. That's what you can tell Jesus, okay? And here's the other amazing thing about Jesus the Bible tells us, because this brother of ours, just like for those of us who are the younger brothers, you have an older brother, they prepare the way for you, making it possible for you to do things that, hey, they couldn't do when they are younger. Sometimes the older brother gets a little bit resentful of that, don't they? I never got to do that at your age. I think I got to go to my first dance when I was 14. My brothers didn't get to do, go to their first dance until I think they were like 16 or 17. Why did I get to go to the first dance? Because my parents saw that it was kind of safe. not, it was safe. It was okay. It was at the school and it was well chaperoned and taken care of. So I got to do it later. They broke open those barriers for me. That's what Jesus does for us. He opens up the barrier that prevents us from getting to heaven because we think we've got to be good to get to heaven. We're not going to get good to get to heaven. Well, what it is, it's the cross that opens up the way to heaven for us. How awesome is that? So our brother has done an amazing thing. But unlike our, my older brothers, Jesus isn't resentful. My brothers, my brothers could be a little resentful. No, I'm just kidding. My, i got great brothers. I do. Number three, under letter B. We not only call God Daddy and God Brother, we call God the Spirit. I love this part of God, because I, I, I love music, I love crafty things, and I just love uh, any type of artwork. And to me, when we talk about, in particular, the Greeks would talk about the muses. You know, there were several different muses, seven different muses, actually, in Greek uh, 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 thinking and so forth. Well, in our case, we talk about the Holy Spirit. When you talk about, oh, I need to be inspired today, it's a Spirit of God that comes down upon you and inspires you to do some incredible things. When you pull out that notebook and you start drawing, that's a Spirit guiding you. When you write a piece of music, it's a Spirit guiding you. When you come to a conclusion that you just didn't know how to, how to fix something or how to work through something, it's a Spirit that's blessing you with that. That's who we're praying to. And that's the type of God we want to have a relationship with. So then the question is, is then why pray? If prayer is all about this, if God knows everything that we need before we ask, why should we even bother about praying? And it's because we've got the wrong understanding of prayer. Prayer is not only about asking. It's also, look at all these blind things. I'm going to throw them out, and I know Joanne's going to come up afterwards and say, give me the hand up, because you're not going to get all these. Just deal with it. All right, here we go. Thanks. Yes, right. She knows. Thanks. Oh, we, we go to God. What's prayer about? Oh, God, I'm so thankful for this day. Look how beautiful this is. Isn't it a great day? Uh, we praise God. I, you're, you're such a wonderful name. Look at how wonderful and splendorous your universe is. Adoration. We listen to God. Oh, this is the important thing. You know how I told you I have a hard time with prayer? And it's sometimes because I, I run out of words to say, and then I realize that's a good thing. I think the best prayer I've ever had is when I run out of things to say and I just shut my trap. And yes, on occasion, I do shut my trap and I'm quiet. Do you know how I do that? I'm going to show you how to, I'm going to show you this. Oh, I got to show you this. This is cool. 
I'm going to show you how I pray. Because my mind, as I told you, just runs a million miles an hour, and I just can't get my mind on, on, on things. And so well, here's what I do. I pull out my guitar, and I just start pick, picking pattern. Now, right now, I'm thinking about the picking pattern, aren't I? Oops, because, oops, I just messed up. And then eventually I start getting it. Oh, there you go. And then I'm, pretty soon I just keep playing this picking pattern over and over again. And all of a sudden my mind stops thinking about the picking pattern. I, and I do that. And I'll be wandering, by the way. I'm a wanderer when I pray. People see me kind of pacing around. Oops. I'm just not pacing around just to pace around. It's, it's prayer. Because the pacing around gets my mind off of all the distractions. I move. Because I'm a mover, right? Chris is like that too. She does that too. We're, we're kind of like that. we got to move. And what happens is, all of a sudden my mind frees from all of those things that crowded around me. So I'll start playing a guitar pattern, and then all of a sudden I'm just quiet before God. My mind is no longer distracted by things. It may not work for you, but it works for me. For some people, they say they go in and they close their door and they kneel down on their knees and they pray, good for you. I could never do that. It would drive me bananas. I have to move because that's just the way I'm made. I don't shut down. I don't stop. I'm just constantly going. And that's okay because God has provided for us a way to connect to him that makes some sense. But once I do that, I can stop and just listen because God wants to speak to us. But we got to get rid of these distractions in our life. Isn't that what a good friend does? God listens to you. It's my turn to listen to God. And then we confess our sins. And I'll tell you, can't you do this with a good friend of yours? You go up to a good friend. And, uh, oh my gosh, let's say it's Susan. I don't know, I'm just making that up. And I go up to Susan, my good friend. I say, Susan, I just, I just really did something stupid. And I really hurt I really hurt Pete. I said some bad things to Pete the other day, or things are just so careless and so thoughtless. Can't you go up and say that to your best friend? And don't you need to? You need to confess those things to them. We can do that with God. Oh, God, I just, I just hurt Pete. I just said something to him. I know that probably hurt him. And, and man, I'm really sorry. Because you know what? I know you love Pete, too. And so I guess I need to find a way to reconcile with him, don't I? So I confess these things to God because God hears them and God listens to them. And God's not sitting there ready to, you know, send us to hell. You've got to get rid of that image of God. God is sitting there to help us, not to harm us or get in our way. And yes, asking, I put that on the last thing. We can also ask God for things. God, give me a million bucks. Hasn't happened yet. You know, you might get a response to that. You know what God's response is when you go up to God and ask God for a million bucks? <laughs> go out and use your hands and get busy, boy. That's what he tells me. Get busy, boy. Start working. <laughs> then you get your own million bucks. That's the answer right here. I'm afraid of the answer, so I don't even bother asking. All right. So let's go on. Uh, letter, the letter B under this next section of why I pray. Because here's the other thing God does for us in prayer. God does change us. God changes us, our circumstances, and our relationships with God. I think this is really cool. Um, I'm going to come back. I actually have a story. I'm going to share that story a little bit later. But God does change us when we pray. See, I told you guys last week that I was struggling with some bitterness. Uh, against a couple of people that I'm really wrestling with and have been for probably six months. And that, God doesn't want that to be a part of our hearts. We've got to get rid of that. And so I've been praying for God to help remove that bitterness against these people. And so that's my prayer. Now, I can tell you for a fact that I'm not at the same place I was six months ago. Six months ago, I literally would have punched these people in the face if I'd seen them. Right now, not so much. I don't think I'd punch them in the face, but I'm still a little angry, okay? Still frustrated. But that does mean that God has moved me. Okay? So prayer does change us if we are dedicated to bring these things to God. And it changes our relationships with God. Let us see. And this is, uh, I leave this part under why I pray because sometimes our prayers go unanswered. Have you ever prayed a prayer and you say, God, why aren't you listening? Anybody who's lost a child, 
can tell you that they've had many nights of unanswered prayers. You as well, I don't want to make light for whatever your situation is. It may not be as serious as losing uh, a, a child. But all of us have had those days where we wonder where in the world God is and why isn't God listening to prayer? Why isn't God asking my, answering my prayer? Because it sure seems like my prayer is a reasonable thing. But there are things that get in the way between us and our relationship with God. Now, I don't say this to throw guilt on you to make, make you feel like you've got to get your act together before God's going to listen to you. So hear me when I say this. I need to be very clear about this. Sometimes your prayers don't go answered because you don't even pray because there's a thing called sin that gets in the way between you and God. And you get real, really recalcitrant. You've got this chip on your shoulder and you relish in it. You know how I talked about my bitterness that I have against a couple of people? If I relish in that bitterness and I keep, I keep rehearsing that bitterness against them, that is going to be a barrier against me being healed from that. Okay? It's not that God can't do it. But as long as I've got that recalcitrant attitude towards them, and I'm refusing to at least humble myself some before God, I am not going to be able to be transformed. So that's why sin can sometimes put a barrier between us and God. It's not God that created the barrier. We create the barrier by refusing to submit. The second thing, our motivation is wrong. Okay, God give me a million dollars. It's like Tevya and Fiddler on the Roof. You know, Tevya and Fiddler on the Roof, if you've ever seen the musical, one of my favorite musicals, he has a song, If I Were, if I were a Rich Man. I love that song. And he's, and he's sitting there. And I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to see the two great uh, actors play uh, Tevya. One, one was, of course, uh, oh my gosh, no, my mind just went blank on, on both of them. Herschel Bernardi. No, yeah, Herschel Bernardi, but I, I didn't see him. But I saw the other ones. Uh, Zero. Zero Mustel. Zero Mustel. I saw Zero Mustel play them. There was another one that was that played that too. I saw two of the two of the three. But uh, Zero Mustel had a very different interpretation of how to play Fiddler on the Roof. And when he would do that, and he sang that song, um, he sang it in a very sarcastic and very witty fashion. And he would get there just like he's singing about how he wanted this wealth and God, why don't you give me this wealth? And then he all of a sudden came to that point where he said, well, God, I'd also give something to the poor, you know. It's almost like he was making a bribe to God. Well, God, if you give me a million bucks, I'll give a little bit of support. It's like people in the church that come up to me and say, I pray to God every night that I'll win the lottery. And, you know, I'll give some money to the church if I win the lottery. And I'm like, well, why aren't you giving some money now? Gosh. Well, they didn't win the lottery yet, so God hasn't blessed them yet. And I'm like, you would just see your life in such a wrong fashion. God has already blessed you. Okay? That type of attitude is just the wrong motivation, the wrong type of attitude, because it doesn't understand how blessed we've been. Okay, third thing under letter C. Because another reason why God sometimes, it seems like our prayer is going to unanswer is because our request isn't good for us. You know what? You know what I pray for God? I'm serious about this. I'm praying for God to give me a P51 Mustang. Um, it's never going to happen. If any of you know what that is, it's a huge yeah, World, uh, World War II fighter with a 2,000 horsepower engine on it. It would kill me. Okay? It would, it would kill me in more than one way. It would take me away from what really needs to happen. So... I don't think God's answering that prayer, okay? <laughs> then, you know, that's just kind of a silly illustration, but here's the point. Sometimes we're, we're just not mature enough to know what we ask for. It seems like a good thing, but it may not be, which brings leads into number four. Sometimes our timing is off. This one I do want to share an illustration, what I shared with the kids this week, and I, I haven't shared this illustration. So this might be brand new to many of you. You may not be aware of this. And I mentioned this to kids in Kentucky. I said to the kids in Kentucky the other day, I said, do you know why you're here today? And they all looked at me and said, why? I said, because I failed. And they're like, what? This is true. 26, 27 years yes. ago, 27 years ago, I was in seminary working on my master's degree at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I was yeah. training for the Olympic trials. That was my goal, to make it to the Olympic trials. And I wanted to stay close to my coach. And um, they gave me an internship in the Twin Cities area in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was, thought it was a great thing. And I went to the church, and I'm a part-time part 
uh, I was working, going to school part-time and also interning part-time at this church. And this church I came into there, part-time student. So I'm only supposed to be there 20, 25 hours a week. So I get there, and what do they tell me? Oh, we want you to do the youth group. We want you to do the evangelist committee. We want you to do the fellowship or the uh, social ministry committee. We want you to preach every other Sunday. We want you to do all the visitation. The pastor doesn't like visitation, by the way. And oh, we're doing a building project. We want you to participate in the building project. Anybody getting overwhelmed yet? Yeah. I'm a 25 hour student pastor. I need a name Eight now. pastors prior to me, interns, failed at this congregation. Now, I get into this, I'm like, okay, 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 okay. I'm getting in there, things are going well until I realize I don't, I don't, I don't know how to do youth ministry. I don't know how committee runs. I don't know the first thing about social ministry. I don't know anything about anything. And so about six to, well, nine months, I guess, into the internship, it's Holy Week, or not Holy Week, it's, it's Lent. And uh, we have a marginally operating fellowship and social ministry thing going on with a dinner and so forth and that I operated and so we got like 70 80 people at this event and and the uh, president of the congregation a little itty bitty woman probably about five foot two her name was Sue and she comes up to me she's a strong woman though she comes up to me and she backs me in the corner she's just poking my chest and she says you know what the pastor's stressed out and when the pastor's stressed out I'm stressed out and you're the reason why he's stressed out. That makes you my problem. And I'm like, okay. And then she says, if, if this were Easter 2,000 years ago, there'd be a fourth cross on the lawn, and you'd be on the fourth one. That's what she said to me. I'm like, okay. Well, I'm going to tell you, I failed that internship. I had to go back for another year of seminary and then go on another internship. And the whole time that year, I was really bitter about it because all my friends were graduating and getting to go and be pastors, and I was hung up because of the stupid church and the way I was treated. And you know what? I'm looking back on it now as the best experience of my life. My failure taught me all the things I needed to know to be here today, and it also put me in a position to meet the people in Hebrew and Kentucky. I would have ever met them otherwise. So I thought I was ready to be a pastor. I wasn't. I had a lot more to learn. And God is good because God provided the opportunity. I was impatient, but in God's timing, God's timing is better than mine. So sometimes their timing is off. You're impatient. You want things now. Be patient. God will provide it. I know it's hard to hear that. But you will look back and say, oh my gosh, God's timing is so much better than mine. The fifth reason, this is a promise that God has. Those promises that God has made, or those requests that we make that are within the will of God, always are answered. Maybe not how we vision them to be answered, but God always listens to us when we pray. I really want to, I think that's kind of almost a good place to end. But real quickly, you do notice that I, I throw out at the end of how to pray. That's what the Lord's Prayer is for, isn't it? I'm not going to go into those things overly much. I just want you to know is that you should set aside some time every single day. Be consistent in your prayer life. Don't be overly optimistic. All people come up to me and say, well, I'm going to pray. I'm going to start praying, and I'm going to pray for an hour and a half today. Don't do that. That's a dumb thing. Pray for two or three minutes today. And pray for two or three minutes every day for the next month. And then maybe expand it to five minutes. And if you want to ten minutes. But you know what? It doesn't matter. The point is, is that you create a discipline. And then also understand that every walking moment of your life is a prayer to God. Just walk like you're talking with God right now. I do that all the time. I'm driving a car. And I'm saying, oh, for goodness sakes, God. I can't believe that person did that to me. Yes, I don't, I don't use any more colorful language than that. I tell you, I don't. Not usually. i got to be really pressed. And then on occasion. Uh-huh. You guys aren't buying that. Okay. Just be comfortable sometimes in silence with God. When you're walking down the street, and just say, okay, God's with me. God, I don't have anything to say right now. But I know that you're with me. Acknowledge God's presence in your life. And the last, connect it to your Bible reading time. 
read a verse, and even if it's just a verse, again, don't be overly optimistic. We're going to get into the Bible reading part next year. Don't be overly optimistic about it. Don't say, I'm going to read the whole Bible in a year. Good for you. Don't bother. If you've never done it before, if you're not a voracious Bible reader, read one verse a day, and you will be blessed. Okay? Just be patient, and God will grow your relationship with Him. And I, I did lastly mention about the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer really is a model prayer that teaches us how to pray. I'm not going to go into that today because I think I've done enough with this and I think I've communicated enough about what your prayer life is supposed to be like. But lastly, just pray your prayer life like you would talk to God like you're talking to your best friend. And if you remember that to be your prayer life, that would be an amazing thing. So I'm going to close with a story. Stories about, I mentioned this man a couple of weeks ago, an acquaintance, a guy that I had the privilege of meeting, Brendan Manning. And I just love Brendan Manning. Again, he wrote the book, uh, The Lion and the Lamb, The Relentless Tenderness of Jesus Christ, which is my favorite title of the book. Uh, it's just such a powerful book. But he was uh, visiting with a lot of us pastors and doing a, a, a conference for us. And he talked about his uncle and about the relationship that his uncle had. He said, I went to Scotland to visit with my uncle on my uncle's 90th birthday. And my uncle, who could barely walk, wanted to walk up this two-mile hill to get up on the hill on his, the day of his birthday. He said it was the craziest thing. It was like 4 a.m., and he's walking up this hill. It takes him forever to get up this two-mile hill. And he sits down, and he watches the sunrise on the day of his birthday. This is what he wanted to do for his birthday. He said, all of a sudden, my nine-year-old uncle jumps up like this and starts going like this and running down the hill and doing a skip like this. And he says to him, are you mad? And he says, oh, no, Sonny, I'm not mad. He says, well, what's going on? He said, I just realized my Father in Heaven loves me so dearly. Uh -huh. Isn't that precious? Uh -huh. That's what prayer life is like. And that's what your prayer life, that's why prayer is for you. That that's what your prayer life is. That you understand when you see the next sunrise, Oh, my Father in Heaven has given you that beautiful sunrise and sunset because He is awfully fond of you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are so fond of each and every single one of us. In our prayer life, you just want a relationship with us. It's as simple as that because you are so wonderfully fond of every single one of us. You made us in your image. We are beautiful in your sight. Prayer is not just another obligation, a thing that we check off our list that we have to do. It's about having a relationship with the greatest friend we could ever have, that heavenly daddy, that wonderful brother, that inspiring spirit. And we give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may you receive the Lord's blessing this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a wonderful time. <coughs>